أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم القول مني في جميع الأشياء قول آل محمد عليهم السلام فيما أسر وما أعلن وفيما بلغني عنهم وما لم يبلغني الحمد لله يا رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأسك السلام على المبعوث رحمة للخلائق أجمعين سيدنا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على قتلتهم وأعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين Even today the Muslims know very little of their prophet's history peace be upon him and his pure family Therefore they believe he died a natural death but in fact he had been assassinated. This fact should not come as a surprise to anyone, given the fact that the Holy Quran had predicted it clearly in chapter Al Imran, as Allah the Almighty said, Wama Muhammadun illa Rasulun kat khalat min kabilihi rusul, afa immata aw kutilan kalaptum ala aqabikum. وَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْهِ فَلَنْ يَضُرَّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا وَسَيَجْزِي اللَّهُ الشَّاكِرِينَ And Muhammad is no more than a messenger. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. If then he died or was killed, will you, turn, will you then turn back upon your heels? And whoever turns back upon his heels not the least harm will he do to Allah, and Allah will reward the grateful. Let's pay particular attention to this section. If then he died or was killed, it confirms that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, would not die a natural death. Rather, it confirms that he would be killed. The conjunctive or in this verse means rather. In Arabic, sometimes or indicates uncertainty and probability. In other contexts, it imparts correction. Since it is next to impossible that anyone should suspect Allah's word, since he has insight into the unknown, Allah must have intended to impart the other meaning. Accordingly, the meaning of the verse is, if he died, rather he is killed. You turn upon your heels. By analogy, Allah said in chapter As-Safat, Speaking of Prophet Yunus, peace be upon him, وَأَرْسَلْنَاهُ إِلَى مِئَةِ أَلْفٍ أَوْ يَزِيدُونَ And we sent him to a hundred thousand, or they exceeded. That is, and we sent him to a hundred thousand, rather they exceeded. In hadiths, even those reported by the Bakri sect, it is confirmed that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, was martyred. For example, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Al-Tabarani, and Al-San'ani, among other famous scholars of the Bakri sect, reported Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, a companion to Allah's Prophet, saying, لأن أحلف تسعا أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم قتل قتلا أحب إلي من أن أحلف واحدة أنه لم يقتل وذلك بأن الله جعله نبيا واتخذه شهيدا I am willing to take an oath nine times that the prophet was, murd was murdered but I am not willing to take an oath even once that he was not this is because Allah made him a prophet and a martyr as well. How then was the prophet murdered? And who were the 
perpetrators of such a heinous crime. It is from this point that the, pro that the paths of the Shiites and the Bakri sect diverge. While Bakri sect claim that the Prophet was poisoned by the Jews, Shiites stress that he was poisoned by his two wives, Aisha and Hafsa, as commanded by their fathers, Abu Bakr and Umar. Let us take a look at the evidence, evidences of each party to decide which one is true. Bakri sect says that when the Prophet's army won the Khaybar battle, defeating the army of the Jews, a Jewish woman, Zainab ibn Tulharith, invited him and his companions to a banquet. That woman wanted to take revenge upon the Prophet because her brother, Marhab ibn al-Harith, who was commander of the Jewish army, had been killed by Imam Ali, peace be upon him, and this had led to the victory of the Muslim army. The Jewish leaders used the women's desire to take revenge and Guel did her into assassinating the Prophet. She poisoned the meat she cooked for the Prophet and his fellows. The Prophet died after having the poisoned meat. This is the belief of the Bakri sect, but it can easily be refuted by the following scientific evidence. Firstly, the Khaybar battle took place in the seventh year of Hijrah, while the Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, died in the eleventh year this means that there is a time gap of four years between the two incidents. It is very unlikely that a person dies because of a poison he had taken so many years ago. It is also because generally the effect of poison is immediate and even if it takes time, it cannot exceed a few months in which the health condition deteriorates gradually. In the case of the Prophet, we notice that he had been in the peak of his health and throughout the side four years he had no unusual health complaints. He would participate in the battles to defend Muslims as usual. Thus, it defies any logic that his health deteriorated suddenly and he died of a poison he had taken more than four years ago despite the fact that he enjoyed good health throughout that intervening period. Secondly, if we accept that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, consumed that poisoned food, it will be a proof of his not being a true Prophet, may Allah forbid. This is because it was the Jews and the women who wanted to put the Prophet under trial by means of their scheme. Is he truly a Prophet who gets revelation from Allah? If he was a Prophet, he would know that this food was poisoned and would not consume it. If not, he would consume it Authentic hadiths provide that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, knew it and did not consume the food. He admonished his retinue not to consume it either. 
This was one of his miracles due to which the Jewish woman was so impressed that she converted to Islam. For that, she earned the Prophet's forgiveness and exemption from punishment. Al-Bukhari and Ad-Darmi and other famous scholars of Bakri sect relate that when Muslims won the Battle of Khaybar, the Jews invited the Prophet to a banquet in which they had served poisoned mutton. The Prophet ordered his followers to call up all the Jews to speak to them. When they were present, he asked them, If I ask you something, will you answer me honestly? Yes, they answered. Have you put poison in this mutton? he asked. Yes, they answered. Why? he wondered. We wanted to know whether you are a true prophet or not, they answered. If you are a true prophet, this would not hurt you. But if you are not, we would get rid of you. Al Khatib relates A Jewish woman cooked poisoned mutton and offered it to the Prophet and his retinue. The Prophet said to his retinue, Do not consume this food, it is poisoned. He then asked the woman, Why have you done this? To which question she answered, so that I can tell whether you are a true or false prophet. If you are true, Allah will reveal you that this food is poisoned so, you'll, so you won't consume it. But if you were false, you would eat it and die, thereby would relieve people of you. Contrary to these hadiths, there are other hadiths that tell that the Prophet actually consumed some of that food. In the process, he admonished his followers to stop eating, and that one of them did really die. The Prophet ordered to have the woman killed. Obviously. These hadiths are not authentic and cannot be trusted. As we have already pointed out, this is because they mean that the Prophet was false, having discovered that the food was poisoned so late that one of his followers had already become a victim. It should be noted that Al-Bayhaqi and Abu Dawood and other great scholars of the Bakri sect confirmed that the Prophet neither killed nor punished Zainab ibn Tulharith. Al-Zuhri, a great ancient scholar, confirmed that the Jewish woman was not killed, although this was commonly believed by some people. Rather, she converted to Islam and was forgiven by the Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family. Third, a most significant hadith as maintained by the Bakri sect to ascribe a Prophet's sudden death to the poisoning attempt by the Jews four years ago is one that was reported by Bukhari from Aisha. She relates قال النبي يا عائشة ما أزال أجد ألم الطعام الذي أكلت بخيبر وهذا أوان انقطاع أبهري من ذلك السم Allah's prophets told me on his death bed عائشة since I consumed that poisoned food after the Khaybar battle I have been in pain now it is the time for my heart to stop beating 
because of that poison. We cannot trust that hadith for many reasons, one of which is the fact that Aisha is an infamous liar. She would lie even to the Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family. Al-Bukhari reported Aisha saying, Allah's Prophet was eating honey at Zainab bin Tujah's place. So Hafsa and I agreed to tell him upon his return that he smelled of maghafir. Maghafir is a substance extracted from a tree. It has a sweet taste but very foul smell. Aisha knew that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, had taken honey from, the, from his other wife, Zainab ibn Tujash. Being jealous of her, she agreed with her friend Hafsa to hurt the Prophet by claiming that he smelled foul when he consumed that honey. Thereby, he would stop eating it and consequently stop visiting his wife, Zainab. That was a lie. A woman who would not abstain from lying to the noblest prophet would not abstain from lying to ordinary people either. Therefore, the hadith reported by her cannot be trusted especially when she herself was accused of being involved in the murder of the Prophet. Naturally, she would try to divert suspicion by pointing fingers at others. Let us not forget that the, that the Holy Quran stated that Aisha and Hafsa were sinful wrongdoers whose hearts deviated from the true path. Allah warned them that by merely marrying the Prophet, they would not be exempted from going to hell. This was set forth in the chapter At-Tahrim. In Tatuba ila Allah, faqad sagat qulubukuma. وَإِنْ تَظَاهَرَ عَلَيْهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ مَوْلَاهُ وَجِبْرِيلُ وَصَالِحُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ ظَهِيرٌ ضرب الله مثلا للذين كفروا امرأة نوح وامرأة لوط كانتا تحت عبدين من عبادنا صالحين فخانتاهما فلم يغنيا عنهما من الله شيئا وقيل ادخل النار مع الداخلين if you both turn to Allah, then indeed your hearts are already inclined to this. And if you back up each other against him, then surely Allah is his guardian. And Jibreel and the believers that do good and the angels after that are the helpers. Allah sets forth an example to those who disbelieve the wife of Nuh and the wife of Lut. They were both under two of our righteous servants, but they acted treacherously towards them, so they availed them not against Allah, and it was said, enter both the fire with those who enter. Two women who lie and receive harsh words from Allah in a full chapter would not abstain from lying. Undoubtedly, they were poised to commit any misdeed, even if it was the assassination of the Prophet himself. Let us not forget that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, had described Aisha as 
the spearhead of disbelief and the horn of Satan. Ahmad ibn Hanbal and other great scholars of Bakri sect related the Prophet, peace be upon him, emerged from Aisha's room, saying this is the spearhead of disbelief. It is from here that Satan's horn emerges. A woman condemned by Allah as wrongdoer and threatened to be tortured in hell if she does not repent and one described by the Prophet as the spearhead of disbelief and Satan's horn, one who confesses to having lied to the Prophet is a woman whose hadiths cannot be trusted, especially if they seem to be in her favor. One of the reasons why we should not believe in Aisha's hadith about the poisoning the Prophet is that she contra contra contradicted, contradicts herself in another hadith. She claimed that the Prophet did not die because of the Jewish women's poison. Rather, the cause of his death was because of another disease. Accordingly to, according to Abu Ya'la, Aisha also said that Allah's Prophet, peace be upon him, died of an ailment, Dhatul Janb. Dhatul Janb is an internal tumor that forms on man's side. It leads to death when it explodes. Aisha claimed that although the Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, had ruled out the possibility of the Prophet developing such a tumor. Due to its being a demonic one that a Prophet would not develop, the Prophet said of that tumor, it is a satanic and I cannot develop it because Allah has delivered me from any of Satan's powers. It seems that Aisha was confused while putting her point before the general public with, regards, with regard to the issue of Prophet's killing. When she claimed he died because of that Jewish woman's poison consumed four years ago, people did not find that very pl plausible. Therefore, she came up with another cause of death. Therefore, she made up another reason, namely that of the lateral tumor. Thereby, she contradicted herself. This confusion itself points fingers at her and even give, gives rise to suspicion about her. Now that we are sure of the implausibility of the back reversion of the Prophet's murdered, peace be upon him and his pure family, due to the shortcomings, contradictions, and poor evidence, now we can move on to the Shiite version. Generally, Shiite hadiths are more credible. They are a set of the statements by the Imams from the Prophet's family, peace be upon them all. Undoubtedly, those Imams were far better inf informed of their grandfathers, the Prophet's history and of his religion. None of them may lie because the Quran confirmed their 
in essence against the sins. The Prophet had ordered that the words and deeds be followed. All Muslims agree to the fact that those Imams were very truthful, noble, faithful and chaste. The Imams confirmed that their grandfather, the Prophet, had been poisoned in his last days by Aisha and Hafsa at the order of their fathers Abu Bakr and Umar. Abu Bakr and Umar were conspiring to usurp the throne after the demise of the Prophet. However, the Prophet would also stress that his rightful successor would be his cousin and the husband of his daughter, Imam Ali, peace be upon him. He even coerced them once to pledge allegiance to him on the Ghadir day. At the same time, the Prophet brought to light the fact that some of his companions and wives would turn against his successor. He warned his followers against this, stressing that it would be the test from Allah. Those who would show their allegiance to the rightful successor would pass the test and go to heaven, while those who would let him down and support the rebels would go to the eternal hell since they would be apostates that is deserters who converted back to disbelief even if they called themselves Muslims sometimes the Prophet would confront Abu Bakr Umar Aisha and Hafsa with the fact that they hated his heir predicting in their presence that their conspiracy will succeed to oust him from power. The Prophet did that as ordered by Allah to put those four into a further test. One of the great ancient Shia interpreters of Quran, Al-Mufassirun, relates a hadith as reported by the Imams that further elaborates on the Prophet's assassination. That interpreter, Al-Mufassir, is Ali ibn Ibrahim Al-Qummi, a great scholar who lived in the days of Imam Al-Hasan Al-Askari, peace be upon him. He was known among Shi'is for his veracity and honesty in the way he related hadith from Imams. The hadith reported by Ali ibn Ibrahim says, The Prophet said to Hafsa, I will tell you a secret. If you divulge it, Allah, his angels, and people will curse you. So what is it? wondered Hafsa. The Prophet said, Abu Bakr will be able to seize the Caliphate and power after me and will be succeeded by your father, Umar. Hafsa wondered, who informed you of this? Allah the omnipresent, the omniscient, informed me. On the same day, Hafsa divulged the secret to her friend, Aisha. In turn, Aisha divulged the secret to her father, Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr came to Umar and said, 
My daughter Aisha told me a secret reported by Hafsa, but I cannot always trust what Aisha says. So, you ask your daughter Hafsa, make sure and tell me. Omar went over to Hafsa and asked her. In the beginning, she was startled and denied it. But Omar said to her, if you have indeed heard the secret, then tell us so we can immediately seize power and get rid of Muhammad. So Hafsa said, yes, he told me that. At this point, those four got together and conspired to poison the Prophet. There is another great ancient scholar of the Quran. Muhammad ibn Mas'ud al-Ayyashi who also belonged to the Bakri sect but was later divinely guided to the true faith and converted to the Shia faith and believed in the Imams. That scholar lived till the end of 3rd century Hijra. Scholars have even have ever since relied on this book and that he wrote to interpret the Holy Quran tafsir when this great scholar reached the point where he interpreted the verse I have referred to earlier he relates a hadith reported by Imam al-Sadiq, peace be upon him, in which he confirms that Abu Bakr, Umar, Aisha, and Hafsa had committed the crime. Imam al-Sadiq, peace be upon him, was sitting with a group of his followers and asked them, do you know whether the Prophet died a natural death or was murdered? Allah the Almighty says, if then he died or was killed. The truth is that the Prophet was poisoned in his last days before he died. Aisha and Hafsa administered poison in his food. Upon hearing this, the Imam Sadiq's followers said that they and their fathers were among the worst villains ever created by Allah. Al-Ayashi relates another hadith attributed to Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, in which he says, Al Hussein ibn al Mundir asked Imam al Sadiq about Allah's words If then he died or is killed, will you turn back upon your heels? Does it mean that the Prophet died a natural death or was murdered? Imam al Sadiq said, In this verse, Allah refers to the Prophet's companions who committed the misdeed. These hadiths confirm beyond doubt that the Supreme Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, was killed by poison administered in his last days and was not allegedly given four years prior to his death. They also confirm that the crime was an act of treachery by his two wives and their fathers. Jews had nothing to do with this. If we take a closer look at the Quranic verse that speaks of the Prophet's death, we notice it is consistency with these hadiths. The verse says, and Muhammad is no more than a messenger. 
Many were the messengers that passed away before him. If then he died or is killed, will you turn back upon your heels? And whoever turns back upon his heels, not the least harm will he do to Allah, and Allah will reward the grateful. In that verse, Allah addresses the Prophet's companions and not the Jews. The verse associates the Prophet's death and the turning back, which means apostasy. We hereby understand that the assassination of the Prophet was to be followed by turning back and apostasy. This actually happened and turned in a favor in favor of the rebels who seized power Abu Bakr and Umar. Thus it was addressed to the accused in the first place and not to the Jews who were no longer a threat in Medina. It is true that the verse was quoted in relation to the Uhud battle to reprimand the Prophet's companions who had let him down by fleeing and leaving him alone with Imam Ali amidst the non-Muslim warriors but the verse also speaks of the future it says that a group of people would turn back and become apostates they would bring no harm to Allah because they would actually be harming themselves as they would go to hell on other hand another group of people would keep their faith and would be well rewarded by Allah and enter the heaven this is because they were grateful to Allah for his blessings by keeping their allegiance to his prophet and his rightful successor it is now evident that the crime was described by these hadiths and this is in consistence with the Quran therefore it is obvious that the Shiite version of the Prophet's assassination is trustworthy. But is there any evidence in the resources of Bakri sect that supports the Shiite version and shows involvement of the Prophet's two wives in the crime? In fact, most of the hadiths that reach us through the pious imams from among the prophets descendants peace be upon all of them are supported by hadiths in Bakri resources even if implicitly it is here that the power of Shiism as it does not rely only on Shiite resources rather it brings forth supporting evidence from the sources of other sects for the facts put forth by the Imams there is a hadith related by the famous scholars of Bakri sect like Bukhari, Muslim, Ahmad ibn Hanbal and Ibn Kathir in that hadith Aisha confesses that when the Prophet was asleep during his illness she put a strange substance into his mouth with the help of the other wives Aisha did it intentionally despite Prophet's prohibition 
When the Prophet woke up, he saw the residuals of the substance that they had put into his mouth. He angrily asked what it was and who had disobeyed his orders. Aisha and her collaborators justified their action saying that it was just a medication. Following that, they accused the Prophet's uncle, Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. However, the Prophet acquitted his uncle and ordered that those who were with him in the room should be punished by having the same substance put into their mouths. Aisha relates, when Allah's Prophet contracted the terminal disease, he told us, don't put the medicine in my mouth. But we disobeyed him on the ground that every patient dislikes medication. So we put the substance in his mouth. When he regained his senses, he wondered, who did that? Have I not admonished you not to do that? So we said, it is your uncle, Al-Abbas, who thought that you might have contracted a lateral tumor. The Prophet said, this disease is caused by the devil. I cannot contract it. The Prophet ordered that everyone in the house must put the same substance into their mouths, except Al-Abbas, as the Prophet said, he was not with you. It seems that people were confused about what had happened to the Prophet. This was the matter that forced Aisha to relate his this hadith in an attempt to falsify and conceal the truth. She wanted to hide the truth of the substance that she put into the mouth of the Prophet, claiming that it was a medication. She explained that what she made was lead, which means administering medication to a side of the mouth. What exactly was that strange substance? Why did Aisha and her collaborators intend to put it into the Prophet's mouth during his sleep. Why did Aisha and her collaborators falsely, falsely accuse Al-Abbas of the crime? Why did the Prophet order to have them punished by putting the substance into their mouth? Basically, how could Aisha and her collaborators disobey the word of the Prophet? These controversies prove that a serious crime was perpetrated against the Prophet. If there had been no crime, the Prophet would not have ordered to punish the perpetrators. If that substance had been indeed a medicine, the Prophet would not have forbidden it to be put into his mouth. This would not have stirred his anger. Therefore, that substance must have been the poison that the Prophet's sons spoke of later. Those who helped Aisha prepare it must have been Hafsa, Abu Bakr and Umar, whose names were not revealed 
by Aisha in her hadith on that strange substance. Their interest was associated with the Prophet's homicide as they were going to seize power and oust his family from there. There remains a question unanswered. Can the two wives of the Prophet dare to kill him? Is it possible that Abu Bakr and Umar, who were among the Prophet's companions, dared to commit such a crime? The answer is, it is not unlikely at all. Because the Quran mentioned that the two wives of the prophets, Nuh and Lut, betrayed them and would go to hell. These verses in the chapter at Tahrim were revealed in the first place to address Aisha and Hafsa by sitting by citing this example. In the same chapter, Allah testified that the infidelity and wrongdoing of Aisha and Hafsa. He threatened them strongly should they fail should, should they fail to repent as I explained earlier. Quran predicted that the Prophet's companions would turn against him as I have said earlier. The Prophet had also predicted in his several hadiths that most of his companions would go to hell. History reveals that most betrayals and acts of treacherous treacheries that occurred after the prophets were committed by their wives and companions. Al-Bukhari related that the prophet peace be upon him and his pure family said on doomsday when I will be at the water pond deliv delivering water to those who will be thirsty among my followers a group of my followers will come to drink but the angels will drive them away and take them to hell I'll say O oh God they are my companions but God will tell me you do not know what they did after your death they degraded themselves to apostasy following that Another group of my companions will come to drink, but the angels will drive them away and take them to hell. I'll say, O oh God, they are my companions, but God will tell me you do not know what they did after your death. They degraded themselves to apostasy. Thus, only small number of my companions will escape like deserted camels in the desert. No one can claim that Abu Bakr cannot be among those people who will be driven to hell, since the Prophet himself did not exempt him from that. Imam of the Maliki school of thought, Malik ibn Anas, relates that the Prophet professed to the Muslim martyrs of Uhud that they would go to heaven. So Abu Bakr wondered, aren't we the brothers who have submitted to Islam just as they did and fought in jihad just as they did? So why don't you give us the good news that we will go to heaven? The Prophet said, It is absolutely true that you are their brothers, but I do not know what you will do after my death. 
Therefore, we should not exempt Abu Bakr and Umar from the crime of having taken the life of the Prophet, especially when they had tried that once before, when the Prophet was on his way back from the city of Tabuk. He had to go past a roof road up a mountain. That road is called Al Aqaba by Arabs. Those who have to go down it on a camel, of, for example, must choose a camel with a very quiet disposition. If it panics, it will trip and its rider will fall and die. Abu Bakr and Umar conspired with a group of the Prophet's hypocrite companions. They would lie in wait for the Prophet at the time of his crossing this Aqaba to frighten his camel so that it falls and he dies. This fact was reported also by the Bakri resources in clear terms. But the Bakri people tried to hide and deny this fact. Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi, a great scholar of Bakri sect, lashed at al-Walid ibn Jami'ah or Jumayah, dismissing him as a liar. But why? Ibn Hazm says, because he related hadiths that state that Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Talha, and Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas wanted to kill the Prophet and made sure that he met with the accident in Tabuk. Al-Walid ibn Jumayr was not a Shiite. He belonged to the Bakri sect. Contrary to what Ibn Hazm said about him, he is so widely known for veracity and credibility that Ibn Hibban would say, Radiyallahu anh, may Allah be pleased with him, whenever, he, when, whenever his name was mentioned. The greatest scholar of the Bakri sect in this field, al Dhahabi, also testified the truthfulness and credibility of this man. If he had not been honest, he would not have his hadith related by the great compilers of hadith like Muslim, al Bayhaqi, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and Ibn Shabba. So, Al Walid ibn Jumayr is not a liar. This proves that Abu Bakr, Umar, and their group indeed tried to murder the Prophet as he was passing through Al Aqaba on his way from Tabuk. This is a famous incident in which Allah saved the life of his Prophet by a miracle the prophet forgave the perpetrators and refrained from punishing them thereby we can be sure that abu bakr and umar indeed wanted to kill the prophet though their plan in al aqaba failed their next plan succeeded by collusion with the daughters aisha and hafsa who administered poison to the Prophet during his sleep. Just as, just as the Prophet forgave those who tried to kill him in al aqaba Imam Ali did the same after the martyrdom of the Prophet, fulfilling the will of the Prophet so that Allah's test continues for them and for the humanity as a whole. In fact, the Prophet was 
just a normal patient. During his sleep, Aisha and Hafsa administered this poison in the Prophet's mouth in order to hasten the seizure of power by their fathers while hosting the rightful successor Ali ibn Abi Talib. It was in this way the greatest and the noblest prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, full prey to the treachery of his two wives and companions. This is a fact that most Muslims are not aware of. هذا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد الشهيد المقتول وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم وقتلتهم أجمعين